Um, it's always important to remember the mechanical axis, uh, and that's often what we're trying to restore. Um, and in the femur, that runs from the center of the uh, femoral head down to the center of the knee, uh, which differs from the mechanical axis, which runs uh, through the diaphysis of the femur, uh, through two mid diaphyseal lines, and actually exits the femur um, medial to the knee. So you can see here that um, those lines are not parallel as they are in the tibia. Um, and they do have separation at the knee and, you know, on average about seven degrees uh, separated um, more proximally. So uh, joint orientation angles are also something we commonly use and especially when we're setting up um, our deformity corrections uh, in order to, um, you know, provide targets for what we're trying to get to. So in the femur, the lateral distal femoral angle um, is our most common angle and its average is about 88 degrees. Um, that's kind of the complement to the medial proximal tibial angle. Uh, and then you can see these other angles. The angles um, anatomically differ. So if you're looking um, there, it's the normal one is 81 degrees. And again, you can see that's measured uh, not from the center of the knee, but from a line that's medial um, along the uh, femoral axis here. So and then finally, the sagittal plane has angles as well. Um, so the proximal, or I'm sorry, the posterior distal femoral angle, um, we often use. This one's often harder to obtain because it requires really good high quality x-rays, uh, but something to keep in mind. Um, and then the slope or the posterior proximal, proximal tibial angle um, is something that uh, should not be ignored um, because it can often lead to difficulties with the ACL um, and flexion extension of the knee. So um, we want to assess our deformities. Uh, that starts with, a, um, with the patient standing. You can see this patient has uh, valgus deformity uh, of her knees. And we obtain standing radiographs um, and start to measure our lines. Um, this is a mechanical axis line through the lower extremity. You can see um, it is lateral uh, to the center of her knee. And we measure how, you know, the magnitude of that deformity. And then we uh, measure those joint orientation angles that I just mentioned uh, to identify uh, where we think the deformity is coming from. And in this uh, case, you can see that 81 is normal for anatomic axis, but um, since we're measuring the mechanical axis here, uh, that is too low and likely where the deformity is coming from in her because her MPTAs in the tibia are relatively normal. Now, if you were to look at um, you know, principles of deformities, a textbook like Paley's, um, you say, okay, I need to find the center of um, rotation of angular correction. And if you were just to use normal angles, you would say, huh, well, I, I've got my, my femoral angle here, seven degrees offset, you know, from the anatomic axis, and I've got my um, distal femoral angle, and they intersect down here in the tibia. So that must be where the deformity is coming from. And um, that's where these um, kind of assessment of deformity can fall apart a little bit if you just try to throw normal angles on, you know, everyone's bones because everyone's bones are not the same. So you're, you're wondering yourself, what did I do wrong? And um, if you try to do this an with anatomic axis planning instead, instead you can see proximally pretty normal, line down the femur, um, exiting medially with a normal anatomic line. Those are also intersecting um, in the proximal tibia. So um, something is still amiss and, you know, so it's hard, sometimes it can be really hard to use this technique to find where you think the deformity is coming from because you already identified that you think it's in the femur. Um, and the reality of this is that, you know, not everyone's bones are the same. And this, this girl is very tall and, you know, her, um, mechanical axis line of her femur is probably only four degrees, uh, really different from her, um, mechanical axis in the femur. And, you know, her lateral distal fem femoral angle, which she doesn't have a normal side since they're both deformed, um, is really probably closer to this. And, you know, once you find the intersection of these two lines, you can see that it's, it's appropriately in the distal femur. So um, if you know the deformities in the distal femur, um, you can say, well, I'm going to, I know where I'm going to make my osteotomy and um, I'm going to intentionally place it where I want. Um, and then work from there. And that was proven uh, using the law of cosines, um, which was, this is the, the key angle that was being measured here. And so I'll kind of go through uh, what that looks like on the next slide, uh, since we felt that her valgus deformity was coming from the distal femur. Uh, you know, this is about osteotomies around the femur. So we draw a line 
from our mechanical axis from the center of the ankle, which we think we like, um, up to a virtual hip uh, through our correction point in the knee. So this is kind of where we want uh, her to be after she's corrected. And we've already decided that we're going to do a distal femoral osteotomy uh, for this patient based on her joint orientation angle. We're then going to draw another line. Um, you know, we can use the standard line here, the standard measurements here um, of around six degrees um, off of her uh, anatomic axis. And then we draw a third line um, that connects these two points. And this is kind of our virtual hinge um, that is going to decide how much angular correction does she need uh, in order to have a straight leg. And so this is the key, the key measurement here is measuring her, the difference between her mechanical axis of her femur and the mechanical axis of um, her straight leg that we want. And we see that that is nine degrees. So we're gonna plan for a nine degree correction uh, in order to get that straight leg. And so you can do this, you know, the old fashioned way, which is to create triangles um, and to measure if I want a nine degree correction, how much am I gonna have to distract the bone if I'm choosing to do an opening wedge? And then using tangents, you can find, okay, I'm gonna need about a nine um, millimeter correction opening wedge to get that accomplished with a 55 degree or 55 millimeter osteotomy. Um, we use computers a lot more now, which you know does the math for us. And so we can basically pick again where our osteotomy is gonna be, pick where we want the hip to be, pick our ankle, and then kind of let the computer uh, do the math for us, uh, which I've shown here. Um, what that looks like in the OR, um, distal femoral osteotomy, here's the patella, um, here's the wedge that we plan for, that gets plated. Um, and then here we see what that looks radiographically. Here is our wedge, here's the plate, um, and then plate in the center of the bone on the lateral. Um, many plates can be used to do this as long as you have appropriate stability. Um, and then here we have, uh, she was corrected on both sides since we saw she had deformity on both sides. And now you can see our line that we started here in the ankle and went through the knee now goes through the center of the hip as well. Um, so her valgus has been corrected and you can see based on um, the picture I showed prior how much straighter her legs look. And this is much better for um, her knees. Now she, her knees her medial and lateral condyles will uh, equally share weight, which will be better for her long-term health. What about varus? Can we use osteotomies around the knee to correct varus? And so, of course, we can. Now we see his mechanical axis is um, much more medial, and the prior patient was lateral. And you'll see here that he also has joint line obliquity, which is often um, a forgotten source of um, mechanical axis deviation in the lower extremity. So this has to be accounted for uh, when we're thinking about what osteotomies we need to correct his uh, overall deformity. So here we see our joint orientation angles. Again, um, 93 is abnormal. So he's in varus and the tibia is also in varus. So what are we gonna do? We need to, we may need to make an osteotomy, right? Well, you showed me last time, you just have the computer do it, right? Um, and you can see here, we'll just need a 22 millimeter wedge, 20 degrees opening, no problem, right? Oh no, that's, that's really too large. That's too much for a single osteotomy to ask for and to do acutely. Um, so we have to rethink our plan to something that's actually achievable uh, in the operating room. So we're gonna make multiple uh, wedges. And what I've actually done here is done three different wedges. Um, I've made a distal femur cut. I've made a proximal tibia cut since we, we saw in the joint orientation angles that they were both abnormal. We have more appropriate sized wedges here, a nine millimeter wedge and an eight millimeter wedge. And I've also made through here an intraarticular osteotomy that's virtual that closes down that space that I showed um, and accounts for six degrees because once the leg is straight again, his lateral side is not going to be gapped open like that. And you have to account for the seesaw effect um, when you're correcting these deformities. And he was so lax, he also actually or underwent an LCL reconstruction at the same time um, as these deformity corrections. So we put that into practice in the OR. We see here very reasonable sized wedges, again, stabilized with plates. This was done on the medial side. Um, in this patient so that the LCL reconstruction could be done. We can see that the lateral side of his joint has been closed down. 
um, and that, you know, he's, you're, we're already seeing healing here in the wedges, what it looks like on the lateral, this ends up being a little bit more anteromedial. Um, and then same or similar case, another bow leg, another varus correction and um, very similar angles as the last patient, but we can also do this from the lateral side with a closing wedge. So here you can see um, similar osteotomy as the first patient, except this time we're gonna use um, this articulating tensioning device um, and a wrench to really close down that deformity. It takes a lot of torque in order to get the bone to um, do what you want. So you hook the plate into the distal segment and then using this proximal screw, you, you close this wedge down. And this is a really powerful tool, especially when you're doing acute uh, deformity correction with closing wedges. And you can see here again, his tibia was done with a frame, but um, you know, straight leg, slight overcorrection, um, purposefully done to offload his medial knee. Vaginal plane can also be corrected. We got a 20 degree uh, deformity here. We draw out our angles. We can show the correction. This time we planned it with a nail, um, which can also be used. It doesn't have to be a plate. Uh, blocking screws were used to make sure we got the correction we wanted. And here we can see our joint orientation angles are normalized. Early healing using percutaneous osteotomies. 